tonight from climate change to immigration. Andrew Scheer face to face with undecided voters. Do you understand the gravity of climate change? The conservative leader takes tough questions right here in the national studio. As a brown Muslim man, where do I fit in the conservative party? Rosemary hosts a special television event. The worst violence yet in Hong Kong, police shoot a protester. Another white officer kills an unarmed black man in the U.S., but this time, the verdict, guilty. And for years, we've been told too much red meat is bad for you. Were the experts wrong? This is The Nation. All election campaign at photo ops and announcements, party leaders have said a lot to you, the voter, about their plans for this country. So this week, we're mixing things up a bit. We're giving voters the microphones, inviting them to sit down with those leaders and talk about what they care about most. In the hot seat tonight, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. This is his first campaign to become Prime Minister. He is the second leader to go face-to-face -face with voters in our studio and with you, too, Rosie, on everything from climate change to immigration. Yeah, he uh, covered a range of topics, Adrian. Yesterday, it was, of course, Justin Trudeau in that chair just over there. And today, Andrew Scheer on the eve of a big French-language debate where the two will face off for the first time in this election. And we now know more about where Scheer stands on some key issues. This time, it was the Conservative leader's chance to convince voters he has the right answers for them and for Canada. How are you now? I'm doing great. You know, First up, I, climate I, I change. Like kind of for Marcus Harvey <laughs> from New Brunswick, we'll the concern is how to on. deal with extreme uh, flooding on his property year stress. after year. What are you going to do uh, that's immediate, that's fiscally responsible and sustainable? Through the Green Investment Fund, that'll spur the types of innovations that have already reduced emissions in so many different sectors. Sheer is not running on a record, but a first-time leader who is still somewhat unknown. So many of the questions were an attempt to better understand his approach. Will your government be as open to immigration and as, and fa as facilitative as the, the current government has mm -hmm. been? I'm very proud of the fact that the previous Conservative government uh, had welcomed uh, record levels of new Canadians from around the world, and that's a legacy that uh, I'll continue to build on. Scheer had not yet talked about how many immigrants a future Conservative government would allow into Canada, but today conceded the Liberal target for 2021 probably makes sense. So if the target right now is 350,000 immigrants by 2021, is that about what you're looking at? Or I think that's reasonable, yeah. And, and again, as long as that's coming from from facts. Scheer was pushed for his positions on Indigenous issues and forced to explain why he appeared at a pro-pipeline protest where some brought an anti-immigrant message. As a brown Muslim man, where do I fit in the Conservative Party? Mm, you fit right at home. We are uh, an open and inclusive party. Just before he came here, though, Andrew Scheer was pitching a plan to drastically cut Canada's foreign aid. As Salima Shivji explains, he objects to where some of that money is going. With a row of flags behind him standing in Canada's biggest city, the stage is set for Andrew Scheer to attack his opponent for failing on the world stage. It's humiliated himself and Canadians by... Scheer's vision is a shift inwards, a deep 25% cut to foreign aid, money to help with disaster recovery, drought and health programs redirected from wealthier and so-called hostile nations to poorer ones. The rest of the savings would go to Canadians. Canadians now can see the choice that between sending more of their hard-earned tax dollars to countries that rank relatively high on the development index, countries like Italy, like Brazil, like Turkey, and hostile governments like Iran. Uh, Justin Trudeau has made his choice. I have made my choice. It's a stretch to claim Canada gives much aid to those countries, and Canada already falls far behind United Nations targets for how much it devotes to helping other nations in need. Justin Trudeau's government set a new 50-year low, despite his rhetoric and a high-profile bid to get a seat on the UN Security Council, a campaign Sheer isn't much interested in. It's more important to me that I help Canadians get ahead than curry favour at the United Nations. The Conservative campaign slogan applied to foreign policy provoked a swift rebuke from Trudeau, who tried to tie the policy to an issue he feels he can own, climate change. Andrew Scheer's climate plan relies almost entirely on action overseas. And now he's proposing uh, to stop supporting countries uh, who are taking action overseas on fighting emissions. 
This is Andrew Shear betting that Canadians care more about their bottom lines than the plight of foreign countries. He's banking shrinking Canada's foreign presence won't hurt him politically. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Montreal. Not too far away, Justin Trudeau was pitching his gun control plan to Toronto area mayors. But as Katie Simpson shows us, there's one key part of it that some would like to see changed. Leaders. Justin Trudeau sat down with mayors from the greater Toronto area to talk about his plan to end gun violence. We need to do everything we can to keep our city safe. It's the second day in a row he's promoted this pitch, which includes allowing cities to ban and or restrict handguns. The feedback from doctors and nurses yesterday was that the patchwork approach doesn't go far enough. What the federal government needs to do is show leadership and do a national ban on handguns. Mayors today publicly delivered that same message. Could I get a show of hands here from mayors who would like a national ban? I can tell you I heard clearly from them that many of them want us and want us to bring a national ban. Yes. So all of the, if you take a look behind you, all those people mm -hmm. are saying national ban. You heard it from the medical professionals, so why not go that route? Uh, we are taking the strongest step uh, in uh, Canadian history to move forward on tougher gun legislation. It's ineffective unless it's uh, more widespread. So we would have, all of us here would have preferred to see it uh, nationally. Trudeau has been vague in explaining why he'd take the city by city approach rather than a national plan. But the Liberals are now offering a partial explanation. I know what it would cost to, to ban and then buy all those guns back. The Liberals do have a buyback plan, but only for assault style weapons. Still to be publicly told two days in a row your proposal isn't good enough. It's not what Trudeau wants. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. I'll be back in about 10 minutes with Conservative leader Andrew Scheer face-to-face -face with undecided voters. And let's go to Hong Kong, where today there was a dramatic escalation of violence. Police shot an anti-government protester, a masked teenager, apparently armed with a metal rod. More than 60 other people were hurt, all of this overshadowing a really important day for Beijing the Communist Party's 70th anniversary. Asia correspondent Sasha Petrosik was there. On a Hong Kong side street, the police were still chasing the protesters. The officers jumping out of vans to tackle whoever they could catch. In some cases, violently. Mayhem keeping its momentum. It was the end of an ugly day with street battles that turned into brawls and seemed to go on forever. And in one dramatic moment, a first for these protests, an officer pulled out a gun and shot an 18-year-old protester in the chest. He's still in hospital. Hong Kong's police commissioner lamented all the violence on China's national holiday. But unfortunately, some rioters choose to do all these, all these sorts of uh, criminal damages. In fact, all these protests came exactly because it is China's National Day. They have been corrupting our system for a very long time. And uh, they are um, taking back many of our rights. The protesters now want democratic rights guaranteed and an inquiry into police brutality. As the police operations continued late into the night, a crowd of regular Hong Kongers, including families, formed to jeer the officers from above. That's exactly the kind of reaction that the police and the government of Hong Kong has to worry about because it's not just the protesters who are opposed to the government and who are demanding change. It's really a very broad swath of the community in Hong Kong. The question is, will that support continue? Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Hong Kong. And so a very different scene played out in Beijing today as China celebrated seven decades of communism with a dramatic show of force and fireworks. (laughs) 
As you can see, the day began with a military parade through the capital, complete with goose-stepping troops and a display of advanced weaponry, including deep-sea drones and an intercontinental ballistic missile never before seen publicly. The day ended with a fireworks show over Tiananmen Square and some highly choreographed performances, all, of course, designed to send a message of serious strength. Meanwhile, a very different celebration today in the U.S. Black leaders are hailing the guilty verdict for a white police officer on trial for killing an innocent black man in his home. Kim Brunover has the details from an extraordinary case. I just pulled my gun out and I yelled at him. It's like, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. Amber Geiger. In September 2018, the former Dallas police officer says she came home from work and parked on the wrong level. She then entered what she thought was her apartment and saw an unarmed stranger inside, 26-year-old Botham Jean, and shot him. I was scared. Whoever was inside my apartment was going to kill me. Geiger's defense team argued it was self-defense. She's an ordinary and prudent person who made a mistake. It's not a mistake. It's a series of unreasonable decisions. The prosecution said Geiger may have been distracted by sexually explicit texts between her and her married police partner. They argued barging into Jean's home was aggressive and reckless. She got on the stand and told you what her intent was. Her intent was to kill. That's murder. Uh, the jury having reached a verdict. The verdict was highly anticipated, the case garnering national attention because historically so many police officers have been cleared of wrongdoing in the deaths of unarmed black men. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Amber Geiger, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. No outburst. And with that, Geiger became the first Dallas officer convicted of murder since the 1970s. The punishment phase of the trial now begins. Geiger could face anywhere from five years in jail to life in prison. This verdict is for... Trayvon Martin. It's for Michael Brown. The attorneys for Jean's family say the verdict is a victory for black America. It's, it's a signal that the, the tide is going to change here. Police officers are going to begin to be held accountable for their actions. Still, Jean was a successful, educated, innocent man killed in his own home while eating vanilla ice cream. His family says it shouldn't take such a clear-cut case for an unarmed person of color to get justice in America. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. And we are following several other stories tonight, including a silver medal win for Andre de Grasse. A huge roar for this hotly anticipated final. Great. It is the first time in 28 years a Canadian has won a medal in the 200 meter at the World Track and Field Championships. The Markham, Ontario sprinter is having a pretty successful comeback season after spending much of the last two recovering from injuries. He also won a bronze on Saturday in the 100 meter race. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex, who are wrapping up their tour of Southern Africa, are suing British tabloid Mail on Sunday and its parent company over the publication of a private letter written by the Duchess. In a statement, the Duke alleges the letter was published illegally and altered to purposely mislead the public. He writes, there comes a point when the only thing to do is to stand up to this behavior. And take a look at this video that shows the moment an arch bridge came crashing down in Taiwan. An oil truck was crossing the bridge at the time. It fell onto several boats below. Officials say six people were seriously injured and still unclear what caused the collapse. If you have ever denied yourself a cheeseburger for health reasons, a new medical review might give you some reason to reconsider. It examined what happens when you cut back on red and processed meat the results are a bit surprising, but as Vicodopia reports, not everyone agrees. Slow cooked to perfection. Who can resist? John Vassallo tried to. I actually went vegetarianism for a while, uh, but then decided uh, I don't think that's, that's the right thing to do. Uh, I think meat's, uh, meat's okay when in moderation. We've all heard the warnings from organizations like the Cancer Society to Health Canada to keep an eye on how much red and processed meat we put on our plates. But a team of international researchers found, after reviewing years of data, that cutting down has no clear health benefit. Based on the research, we cannot say with any certainty that eating red or processed meat causes cancer, diabetes or heart disease. 
The study recommends adults continue current red and processed meat consumption. It's a finding that's prompted calls for a retraction. The most prominent critic, Harvard School of Public Health, which labeled that conclusion irresponsible and unethical. Even three people on the research panel objected to the findings on red meat consumption, given the lack of evidence, which this co-author accepts. So it, it was a difference in opinion about how fully informed people would deal with the choice. And we don't have the studies to tell us how fully informed people would deal with the choice. Nutrition research has long been controversial and open to interpretation or reinterpretation, leading to conflicting advice. We used to be warned away from saturated fat. Now the science says it's okay in moderation. But conflicting research comes at a price, according to this cardiologist. So either we need to produce good data or we need to stop arguing about these things because otherwise we're just going to be putting out studies that contradict studies that came out the week before and that's just going to make the public and most of the medical community just cynical about the whole process. This latest research is unlikely to change any minds about the risks of red meat, but it shows there's still a hunger for that answer. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, time for a quick break. Rosie is next with special coverage right here on The National. Andrew Shear goes face to face with undecided voters. We brought them together here in this studio so they could put their questions directly to the Conservative leader. You and I aren't going to live to see the end of the world, but our grandchildren could very well burn. Your young daughters are not going to be able to ever consider becoming teachers or judges because of, of our, our problem with the secularism law. I do like uh, conservative fiscal policies. However, I'm finding it difficult to cast my ballot for the conservatives. The pursuit of home ownership keeps going away and away and away from us. If you do that work and you make those promises, then you must actually do that. Some of those people are out of touch. Their questions, his answers, and later we ask the undecided change. voters how they think Shear did. All that in Face to Face with Andrew Shear right after the break. And welcome again to the National Studio here in Toronto, where tonight we are again doing something a little new. We promised that this election would be about you, your questions, your concerns. So, unusually, we've decided to give as much of our interview time with the federal leaders over to you, the voters, and they have, thankfully, agreed. Welcome once again to Face to Face with the Federal Leaders. I'm Rosemary Barton, and in our studio tonight, undecided voters again looking for answers. And we've invited five Canadians from across the country to speak one-on-one -on -one with the leaders. Last night, Canadians heard from Justin Trudeau, and tonight, it's Conservative leader Andrew Scheer's turn. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you. I know you're a busy guy, so I appreciate you making the time. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much. And so everybody knows, because they often wonder how much you've been told. You were given the first name, hometown, broad strokes of what these people want to talk about, but otherwise, you're on your own. Uh, That's right. <laughs> each participant has shot a little bit of a video, so you can get to know them a little bit. Um, so let's get going. Hello, friends. Marcus Harvey here along the mighty Woolastook, a.k.a. the St. John River. I am coming to you from Majorville, New Brunswick, which is about 10 kilometers east of the capital city of Fredericton. My family has been here for 100 years, and I've been here for about 50 of them. Uh, I'm married. I've got three sons, and in my spare time, I enjoy drinking and collecting whiskey, uh, amateur photography, hanging by the pool, but mainly watching my kids play sports. Now, where I'm standing now, in 2018 and 2019, we had the most epic and destructive floods of all time. So one of my main concerns for this election is what a potentially new government and prime minister are going to do to steer Canada in our fight against climate change and global warming, hopefully doing it all without sticking their hands in my pants and taking my hard-earned tax dollars. Time will tell. All right, Marcus, over to you. How are you now? I'm doing great. You're I, not nervous? I, uh, I'd love to know what kind of whiskey you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that maybe okay. later on. <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you today about climate stress. Um, it's kind of a hot uh, topic right now, and it deals mainly uh, in the news with uh, people stressed out about where the climate change is going in global warming. Um, it also uh, deals with people like myself, who you just saw have gone through a couple of floods. Mm -hmm. For the first 40 years of my life, we've had four floods. Mm -hmm. In the last 10, we've had seven. If the water goes over the road next year, it'll be four in four. Wow. So my question for you is, do you understand the gravity of climate change and global warming, and should you form government, what is Canada going to do, what are you going to do 
to help fight climate change and global warming uh, as a country? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much for the question. I can tell that it, it's something that you're very passionate about, and, and rightly so, given <laughs> given the impact it's had. been underwater the last yeah, two yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, absolutely, uh, I believe that uh, tackling climate change and reducing emissions is a priority for, uh, will be a priority for the Conservative uh, government. Uh, you talked about how the carbon tax is have, having an impact on middle class families. We know that they're paying more. Uh, all the while, under this current government, there's been a, a major exemption granted to large industrial emitters. Absolutely. So what our plan does is uh, it will force large industrial emitters to pay into a green investment fund that will uh, stimulate research and development. We are going to repeal the carbon tax, which will uh, reduce the cost of living, make life more affordable. Uh, and we are going to take the climate change fight global. Uh, that means exporting more of what Canada uh, can produce here at lower emissions. For example, aluminum. Uh, we can produce aluminum in Canada at a fraction of the emissions that can be produced, uh, th th that are emitted when that same unit of production is emitted in China, uh, thanks to our clean electricity, our hydroelectricity in Quebec, and uh, other types of innovative products. And we're also going to invest in mitigation and adaptation. Uh, you mentioned flooding. We're going to add a lens to uh, federal infrastructure programs specifically designed to mitigate against the impacts of climate change. So where there are increased inc incidences of funding of, of flooding, those municipalities will be eligible for funding to help and we didn't have that where I'm from. Like, we had mitigation, but... Uh the, the stress of it all, like for someone like me in that area, we had people that were uh, displaced for two weeks. We had people that were displaced for an entire year waiting for funding and mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, we had people that totally lost their homes. Mm -hmm. Mitigation is great, but my question is, is what are you going to do uh, that's immediate, that's fiscally responsible and sustainable to tackle this because it is, you know, you know, you and I aren't going to live to see the end of the world, but our grandchildren could very well burn. So yeah. it, it's got to be uh, addressed immediately. Well, last question there, Mark. Okay, well, as I said, mitigation is part of it. You rightly point out that the focus has to be on reducing emissions and avoiding the effects going forward. And that is what our plan does. So uh, the, through the Green Investment Fund, that'll spur the types of innovations that have already reduced emissions in so many different sectors. Uh, the Green Patent Tax Credit will uh, be a hub, be a magnet for investment for research and development. And taking the climate change fight global is a huge part of it. Uh, molecules of CO2 don't need a, a passport to travel around the world. So if we can export carbon capture technology, if we can help uh, other countries deal with their emissions as well, we should pursue that. Our green home renovations tax credit will also incentivize Canadians to invest in their home, reducing their emissions and their energy consumption bills I did while see putting that, a, yes. a tax credit back in your pocket. Okay. Do, do you believe that climate pricing can change behavior? Well, what we know is that if the Liberals want to change behavior through a tax, and I, I have to challenge on the use of the word price. When a price, price or is, tax, right? you can use okay, whatever you like. Okay, because a price is something that the market sets based on supply and demand, and you have a choice of whether or not you want to pay it. But when the government sets it and collects it, that's a tax. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to know if, if, if I had the opportunity, and I will soon, finally, when he shows up to a debate, is to ask Justin Trudeau, how high will his carbon tax go? Because in order for it to achieve the targets, uh, early conservative estimates are that it would have to rise to over $100. Marcus, how, how are you feeling? Um, for me, the carbon tax, it's not changing my behaviors. I mean, I already recycle and reduce and, and do what I can, but uh, taxing, you know, when I see the tax dollars going to the government, uh, no offense, but overall, I find the government are, you know, they're slicker and deer guts on the doorknob. They're, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that expression, Marcus. I, that is a, <laughs> that is a new one. I'm gonna, I might try to use that to the campaign. But you do not offend a conservative when you said there, when you say there needs to be less government. Okay, thanks, Marcus. Appreciate it. All right, let's move on to our next voter. My name is Jenna Evelyn, and I live in saint georges de beauce which is a small city in, this, in southern Quebec. I am a seventh generation Canadian. I live here with my husband and our son, who is 19 months old, and we have another baby on the way. Yay! <laughs> I work here in saint georges as an immigration lawyer. I, I help a lot of uh, immigrants come to our region to study to work. I'm an undecided voter, but this year I've, I've been considering changing my vote, so I'd like to uh, question uh, the Conservatives on their immigration policies to see whether it would be something that I could get in line with. Hi there. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you for taking time to meet with me. My pleasure. So, as you saw, a big issue for me is immigration. I, both personally and professionally, because uh, professionally I work in an immigration firm, and so I work with a lot of businesses. 
that are bringing in foreign workers that want to stay as permanent residents, but I also run an immigration clinic where I meet with the families. I'm meeting with people who are struggling to bring their families over, who are struggling to, to, to be able to stay as permanent residents and, and to navigate the system. Um, in the last four years, I've seen that the Liberal government has made a, a, a lot of efforts to to improve the system, to try and open things up, to help people, to facilitate, to come talk to stakeholders. I want to know, if you form the government, the next government, will, will your government be as open to immigration and as, and faci as facilitative as the, the current government has mm -hmm. been? Well, uh, absolutely. We will have a, an open and inclusive and welcoming immigration party uh, policy uh, that will uh, ensure that Canada has, uh, has much needed new Canadians coming to our country to keep our population growing and to fill in gaps in our workforce and to, and to continue to be a, a safe place for people fleeing persecution, civil war or natural disasters. So uh, I'm very proud of the fact that the previous Conservative government uh, uh, had welcomed uh, record levels of new Canadians from around the world, and that's a legacy that uh, I'll continue to build on. And will you also be willing to look at regional differences to make sure that the policies um, are, are effective where, where we've got the problems? For instance, in Quebec, in, in my region, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the country. It's in, 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 our, in our region, especially, it's quite, it's, and it's very difficult then to find the workers. But what we are also finding is that the policies that we have they're federal, they tend to apply to the whole country, but our region, our, our, our reality is very different. And what we need is a, a government that's willing to look at that, work with stakeholders on the ground to find solutions that work for the different realities mm -hmm. that we're living in. For instance, in Quebec right now, we've got a, a new policy that says to our, our Muslim foreign workers, you know, your children, your young, your young daughters are not gonna be able to ever consider becoming teachers or judges because of, of our, our problem with the secularism law. Um, and that's something that affects whether immigrants are going to be willing to stay and work mm -hmm. and integrate their families. But I feel like the, the federal government is, is trying to pass that off as, oh, it's not really our problem. Mm -hmm. But each region has its own reality, and it's important to us that, that the, the federal government's willing to look at us as a, mm -hmm. a separate, separate from just the whole country as a, as a whole. Uh, there are so many duplications between provincial and federal levels of government, and one of the things I believe in is, is simplifying that. So, for example, in Quebec, there's often a necessity for a labor market opinion to determine whether or not there is a need in a particular uh, area, and then there's a federal requirement for that as well. And often when a, when a, a permit is granted, the, on, the, on the labor market opinion side, the clock starts ticking before the person actually gets the visa. So they're often coming to Canada and they've already lost two or three months of their ability to work here. And that's creating a, a whole a, a slew of problems for uh, employers and for people who want to come to Canada. On this. Can, you, can you tell me uh, immigration levels? I do, I'm not sure that you've said <coughs> yet what your immigration levels are, you're, you're going to set them at. But what, what number are you looking at? Is it as high as what the Liberals have now, given our aging demographic, or, or where where is your head at for that? Well, this is a, an excellent question because I really do believe that this should be a number that is not politicized in nature. This should be a number that uh, is arrived at when Statistics Canada and experts in various fields say, we need this many people to come uh, to fulfill the gaps in the workplace or to, uh, uh, to ensure that we have a growing population, combined with a humanitarian component for family reunification and refugees. So uh, there will be some who will have uh, an auction to go higher and higher, and, and some parties will have an auction to go lower and lower to kind of politicize it. But what I'm saying is it shouldn't be a subject of politi politicization. I think Canadians have confidence in their immigration system when it's working right, which is why we want to address the issue at the borders so that people can see and have confidence that our, pro our immigration program is based on orderliness, fairness, and compassion. That, that, that's, all, that's all great, depoliticize the issue, but you still didn't give a number, and you would have to set a target as government. Mm -hmm. that, that's part of your job, is to set a government so if, a level. So if the target right now is 350,000 immigrants by 2021, is that about what you're looking at? Or I think no? that's reasonable, yeah. And, and again, as long as that's coming from, from facts, from evidence, from a, a look at the situation and an understanding of where our society has needs, then absolutely. Okay. When we come back... We're going to take the GST and HST off of home heating bills. Uh, we're going to bring in the green home renovation tax credit. Okay, that, that's great, but my wife and I don't own a home. More Face to Face with Andrew Shear next on The National. Welcome back to Face to Face with Andrew Shear. Let's get to our next questioner. 
I'm at the base of Dreamers Rock in my home community of Whitefish River First Nation, where I was born and raised in the province of Ontario 57 years ago. My name is Maggie Sywink. I come from a large extended family of 12 siblings and 43 nieces and nephews. This is the first year that I've ever registered for a federal election. Some of the concerns that I have include, will the government create a balanced budget while maintaining services to marginalized Canadians? Good morning, uh, Mr. Good morning. Shear. Good morning. Um, my name is Ani Boju. Welcome to the lands of the Mississauga of New Credit. Um, we welcome you here. Um, I think most importantly for me as an Indigenous woman, um, when I think about fiscal responsibility is I look at my own, my own spending. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important for me to uh, look at the potential government that's coming in to ensure that they have a policy in place that will continue services for marginalized Canadians. So you may be thinking about a lot of cuts, but you still need to provide those services for um, Canadians. Uh, my vote will depend on that for sure. Uh, my vote will also depend on your willingness to um, look at things like, for instance, my sister is um, one of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in this country, and it's been 25 years. Mm. So I would like to know your commitment um, to the grassroots families of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls mm -hmm. and how you're going to address the um, intergenerational healing mm -hmm. that is necessary for us to move forward. Yeah, well, first of all, my deepest sympathies and, and condolences. I, I, I cannot even imagine the, the grief and hardship that you're, that you're continuing to go through uh, with the loss of a loved one. Um, and, uh, and I want to assure you that when we talk about getting back to balanced budgets, uh, we're going to do that in a way that maintains core services, essential services, health care, social programs as well. Uh, Conservatives believe that the role of government is there to, to uh, help those who cannot help themselves. So when you talk about marginalized uh, Canadians, that is precisely where we think there is a legitimate and, and, and much needed role for government. Uh, so we're gonna, we, we've made that commitment to maintain funding for those services and increase it and improve it in areas where uh, we know it can make a difference. Uh, where we've uh, announced that we're going to eliminate spending to get back to balanced budgets uh, is on things like corporate welfare, where we see billions of dollars going to highly profitable companies or um, uh, CEOs and, and shareholders. Uh, and today I made the announcement that we're going to uh, cut foreign aid funding that goes to uh, countries that are ranking relatively high on the development index and put that money uh, back into Canadians pockets to help improve their quality of life. Most importantly I think for me it's not this it's not the spending yes. it is the spending wisely. Yes. That is critical in the way my vote will be um, looking forward um, to ensure that the government coming in will do those things for Canadian people. I do not want tax dollars spent um, like there's an, a blank check. Mm -hmm. We need to balance budgets. We need to ensure that we still have services for people in this country that really need them. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, we don't, conservatives don't measure the success of government by how much dollars are spent. We measure it on results. Are we actually getting what we're paid for, what we've paid for? And massive deficits for years and years and years, as we've seen under this government, will will threaten those types of uh, programs and services. So I'd like to work with Indigenous leaders and say, okay, let's, ne let's not just give a block of money to, uh, to build a water facility. Let's make sure that there's ongoing funds for training because many times a facility is built, but then because there aren't people on reserve to maintain and, and, and keep the facility up and running over the long term, there's a need for that as years go by. I so, think, you know, I think most last point importantly, here, Maggie. Last point. I think most importantly for um, people that I know around the country, Indigenous people, that you need to start working with grassroots activists, people who are on the ground, people who know what's needed on the ground. Sometimes the leaders aren't in touch with those things okay. because they come from another place. So, you know, if you if you do that work and you make those promises, then you must actually do that. Okay, so not just the, the, the leadership, not just but the, also the people on the, the ground. Not just the figureheads because okay. some of those people are out of touch. Okay, okay. I appreciate that okay. feedback. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, all, all right, best. let's Good move on to our next you. questioner. My name is Brian Stewart. Uh, I live in South Surrey, British Columbia with my wife, my seven-year-old daughter, and my 22-year-old stepson. I work full-time for a building envelope 
engineering company. We are very concerned, however, with the increased cost of living. We rent the house that we're currently residing in. We would really like to own our home one day, but a down payment of over $200,000 in our neighborhood is unrealistic. What specifically would you do to improve housing affordability and the potential home ownership for thousands of Canadians like ourselves? Hey, Brian. Nice to meet you, Andrew. Thank nice you for meeting me. I'm really proud to be here um, representing Canadian families. Um, my question specifically to you is, on October 22nd, you have the potential to be the next government of this country. <clears throat> what specifically, what specific steps, sorry, would you take to put more money in the pockets of ordinary Canadians such as ourselves? Well, thank you very much for this question. This is the theme of our campaign. It's uh, a government that runs within its, uh, sorry, a government that lives within its means so that we can put more money back in your pockets so that you can get ahead. That, that's everything that we're doing is geared around leaving more money in your pockets. It started with our universal tax cut. Uh, this is a reduction in the first income tax bracket that for the average hardworking couple will mean $850 worth of savings. Uh, we're boosting RESPs so that when uh, couples are saving for their children's education, we're increasing the grant that the government puts into that, bringing back the, the green public transit tax credit. We're going to take the GST and HST off of home heating bills. Uh, we're going to bring in the green home renovation tax credit. That will okay, allow that, you to invest. That's great, so but my wife and I don't own a home. Mm -hmm. Like thousands of Canadians, we rent. In the last two years alone, we've uh, been, had to move twice because of evictions. Mm -hmm. um, and our rent has increased from about 35% of our after-tax income to almost 60% in 18 months. Mm -hmm. We can't save for green home renovations, and the pursuit of home ownership keeps going away and away and away from us. One of the pressures, particularly in British Columbia, is the, uh, the influence of foreign ownership on Canadian real estate. We have uh, uh, people from outside the country buying up huge plots of land, and to them, home ownership, uh, sorry, uh, real estate is just an investment. Mm -hmm. Would your government commit to closing some of these loopholes to make sure that the playing field is level for all Canadians? We believe that there should be um, consideration for regional differences. When you have a very hot, booming market uh, for a period of time, that should, the, the policy tools that are used to fix that shouldn't apply all the way across the country in areas that may not be experiencing that. Even within British Columbia, even within the greater Vancouver area, there can be differences in the housing right. market. Uh, so one of the things that I've announced is that we are going to rework the stress test. Uh, uh, it's had a lot of unintended consequences, and we're going to bring back 30-year uh, mortgages for first-time home buyers, making that uh, the dream of home ownership okay. more accessible. And one more point on this: when, it, when we're talking about affordability and housing prices, we are the only party that is talking about the supply of housing units, about making sure that federal infrastructure dollars are going to municipalities that have a great, a, a better track record on reducing development times and development fees. Time for a quick break. Up next, as a brown Muslim man. Where do I fit in the Conservative Party? More face to face with Andrew Shear next on The National. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, it's a billion dollar industry, and the athletes, they don't get paid. We talk about a major law change that could put money in college athletes' pockets. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer is here taking questions from undecided voters. Watch this. Hi, I'm Omer Ali. I'm 30 years old and I live in Brampton, Ontario. I'm currently working as an analytics manager in the corporate retail world. Um, I like to spend my free time uh, playing sports and cooking. I was seven years old when my family immigrated from Pakistan to Canada. Being a first generation Canadian and an immigrant child puts you in this unique position because it allows you to pursue your Canadian dream, all the while being protected uh, from the hardships of an immigrant life by your parents. Historically, I have voted for either the Liberals or the Conservatives, uh, depending on the issues that are important to me. As a brown Muslim man, where do I fit? in the Conservative Party. Mm, you fit right at home. We are uh, an open and inclusive party that we've had uh, tremendous support from Muslim Canadians. We've uh, we had uh, Muslim members of parliament and uh, we have uh, the, the, uh, uh, the first Muslim uh, senator as well. Uh, and we welcome people from all over the world regardless of faith or background. So you have backed a candidate um, locally in Mississauga who has said some very Islamophobic things um, in the past. Um, 
you yourself have spoken at Yellow Vest rallies, and your campaign chair is a former director of, the, of Rebel Media. It just doesn't kind of work. Well, I'll challenge some of the, the misconceptions that you've uh, brought up. Uh, I spoke at a rally in support of the energy sector, uh, attended by thousands of people who are desperate, who are out of work, who have seen their businesses go under and uh, who have lost their homes and are just in a, in, a, in a tremendous state of anxiety and fear for the future. And the organizers of that of that event it took great pains, uh, took great steps to keep it focused on, on the energy sector, and that's what I was speaking to. Uh, and uh, and you know the, the candidate that you mentioned has uh, has uh, taken responsibility for for comments that that she had retweeted and apologized and committed recommitted her support for diversity and inclusion and uh, and celebrating the contributions that Muslims have made to this country. So going back to the the rally. Um, I understand what you're saying, and I do understand that you know the purpose of the rallies and the history of the Yellow Vest movement is for jobs and people who are hurting because they don't have work anymore. But it, it, there's a different undertone in, in that movement in Canada. There is a sort of a racist, uh, racist rhetoric, uh, very anti-immigration. I mean, I mean, Faith Goldie was there speaking as well. So it's it's hard. No, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, it's glad to see. I'm glad you're asking these questions because yeah. it's just not true. Uh, th this wasn't a, a so-called yellow vest rally. This was a, an energy sector rally. This was people who were who supported our energy sector, who want to see pipelines built again, who have the frustration. Can you imagine watching a small business in the energy sector go under and auction off equipment to American companies who are driving those brigs across the border just to invest in the energy sector in a country that we're competing with? That's what this event was at, and uh, and the person you mentioned was was not uh, invited she was not part of it it was you know down the street and and the liberals and NDP tried to make the association and what I said at the time was I'm not gonna let that happen I'm not gonna I'm not going to allow that brush to be painted on the thousands of Canadians who are there to fight for their jobs and fight for their industry I will always speak out against those people who spread hateful messages that's not what that event was well I was there to show my support for the hard-working men and women who are affected by Justin Trudeau's energy policies um, can you say today that there, that you'll have any policies going forward if you are elected into office for being a more inclusive party? Uh, well, yes. I, I mean, I, we support uh, programs that uh, celebrate multiculturalism and celebrate the contribution of uh, Canadians from from all across, uh, from all around the world. I've been honored to be invited into the homes of uh, so many uh, people to celebrate uh, Muslim uh, holy days, and uh, that's something I'm going to continue to do to show the signal that we, that there is a home for you here. We are a party that welcomes people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds. If they're uh, as long as you believe in uh, in uh, in fiscal responsibility, lower taxes, and more vibrant economy, uh, you have a home in our, in our party no matter what your background is, no matter what faith you practice, no matter what country you come from originally. Okay, Omar, good job. You heard their questions, his answers. Now it's time to hear what the undecided voters really thought, their impressions right after the break. At this point, we'd normally bring you the moment, but tonight we are turning that space over again to the voters who went face to face with Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. We got their reactions to his answers. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cool to actually be able to sit one on one with the uh, leader of a, a federal party and have five minutes with their ear. I think it was a nice conversation that we got to have for a few minutes. I really enjoyed uh, getting a chance to talk to Andrew Shear. It was short, it went by really fast. It would have worked out a lot better if I'd had a glass of whiskey instead of water. Mr. Shear was there to listen to uh, Canadians and we were there to ask the hard questions. Uh, well, my question was on climate change and how they would uh, deal with it if they were to form government. and. I wanted a more uh, immediate response. I'm satisfied with what he said. Um, I just wish it was different than what I've heard before. It's approachable, but I think on the flip side, I also found that it was almost it was almost too agreeable. The best politicians in the world, I guess, are very good at the non-answer, and he seemed to be already be finding his way with that. He answered the questions. Uh, he was direct, and I felt he was honest. Well, coming into this experience, um, Andrew Scheer was the, the lesser of six evils for me, so um, I'm still leaning towards Scheer. Uh, I'll watch the other debates and uh, the other uh, town halls and, and see how it goes. I'll be watching for their words and their actions um, to ensure that, you know, they are going to um, 
make realistic promises. Not satisfied enough yet to make a decision on who I'm voting for. I still three weeks left of the election. I'm going to see how things play out. I think the whole format of today's session was beneficial. It shows that Canadians can have, have a voice in our democracy. It's our uh, right as a Canadian to be involved, to, to understand and know at least some of the issues, and then to voice what's important to you. Well, that last sentiment makes me happy. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of The National. You can watch the full conversation on CBC Gems, cbcnews.ca, and after your late local news on CBC Television. Remember, we're doing this all week long. Tomorrow, Green Party leader Elizabeth May goes face-to-face -face with undecided voters. We will see you then. Have a good night.